Hey everybody, Jay Widener, Reality Check. Thanks for watching. I finally hit uh, 25,000 subs. Thank you very much. Really appreciate it. Uh, I put up my interview with Alana Freeland and it was a scorcher and YouTube uh, took it down and said that if I do that again, I'm going to give me a strike. And I've already gotten the one strike for the Zabruder film that I did. So I don't think I want to get another strike. So I don't know what I'm going to do with her a video. I'm going to have to edit it or bleep it out or something, but it's super scorching hot as usual with her. And um, so I'm kind of sad. I was going to play that uh, last uh, Saturday and then YouTube kind of came after me. Uh, what else is going on? Not much. Uh, outside of World War III starting, everything seems to be going pretty good. Um, so today I got a, a, a special guest. Uh, he's not really uh, well known, but that's why I have him on because I want his story to get out. It is Hans Messerschmitt. And uh, he uh, spent a long time in Nepal and um, kind of learned a lot of the secrets of that part of the world. And uh, I want to talk to him about that. So, uh, hey, uh, Hans, thanks for coming on. Yeah, thanks, Jay. Thanks for having me on. This is an exciting experiment. <laughs> yeah. Um, so um, Nepal is a strange place. You know, I know, I know a lot of people from Nepal, and uh, uh, my wife has a lot of friends from Nepal, and um, uh, it's, it's, it's a very interesting environment as far as the... Uh, the uh, the types of ecosystems that are there and uh, the government is actually kind of interesting and uh, they have all of this um, uh, kind of uh, almost like uh, the bond tradition of Buddhism a little bit uh, spread out there, which is really links it back to thousands of years of tradition going back. So uh, tell us about what you think about what uh, Nepal is about. Wow, Nepal. <laughs> so I grew up there from pretty much 1980 until 1995. Um, I lived in Kathmandu. I've traveled all over the country, however. Um, my father was there in the 60s in the Peace Corps. He came back, did his doctoral dissertation um, because he's a cultural anthropologist. He studied a uh, unique group of gurungs way up in the Manung Valley. Uh, the, their village literally hangs over a cliff. <laughs> really? and, uh, and then in 1980, my sister and I moved to Nepal. I was four years old, turning five, and we were invited up into the village group for the Festival of Desai, which is happening right now. Um, it was an incredible experience at that age to see something completely different than what I had grown up around um, yeah. in the U.S. And uh, yeah, um, lived there pretty much off and on until 1995 when I graduated from the international school there. And then I went back several times, 96 and then 98 for a half year internship and then two months doing my thesis work uh, for the university I was going to in Bhutan. Um, I always tell people, you want to find out what's going on with the world, look at Nepal. Uh, in the 1950s, Nepal was a 15th century nation. No offense, but they, they were not, you know, caught up with the rest of the world. And in the time between then and now, they've become a 21st century nation. And to see that kind of change over that little time has been rather amazing. Yeah, it, is. it was so isolated. And then all of a sudden it just opened up, you know, out of the blue. And it must have been quite the cultural shock for those people. Yeah, I, I can imagine. A lot of it happened later on um, when some of these groups from United Arab Emirates uh, and, and other places came in and they're like, hey, we want to build these you know, communities and high rises and we need people to work for us. And we have these five year contracts and you'll make great money. And because Nepal is such a caste system, obviously they went to the upper caste families first and they're like, what do we need this for? We have restaurants, we have hotels, we have banks. And so the little rock crusher on the side of the road is like, God, sign me up. <laughs> right. So he goes to Dubai, you know, UAE and some of these other places and comes back in the poly terms after five years, a millionaire and starts building gated communities and, you know, renting them out to the, the locals and, and uh, expatriates that come into the country. And so it, it, it literally flipped a lot of what was you know, cast and major cast on its head because here are these untouchables who have money and power. <laughs> right. 
So yeah, <laughs> I'm loving it. <laughs> Definitely interesting scenario to watch play out. Yeah, over, over yeah, here. that is amazing. So of all, you know, all of your experiences there, what was like? Uh, I always ask people this, you know, <laughs> what, what was your weirdest experience? Wow, weirdest experience. Um, that's an interesting one. So it would have been when I was very young uh, up in the village. Um, my, like I said, my sister and I went to the village during the festival of Desai. Um, they sacrifice an animal in your honor. And at five, you know, watching the head of a buffalo come off in one swipe was a little bit odd on top of all the magic and mysticism and shamanism that was going on in the practice. And so, wow, uh, that to me has just stuck out forever. Okay. Um, it was done with a samurai sword that was taken off of an officer in Brunei. And so there are a few of these relics that survive in the villages of Nepal. Um, when the Maoist insurgency came through in the late 90s, early 2000s, they, they knew the villagers had all these weapons and guns from you know, their time as Gurkha soldiers during the war. And so a lot of the women realized this and were like, oh God, we're going to hide these in the nettle fields because <laughs> nobody goes into the nettle fields with them. Wow. <laughs> wow. <laughs> so <laughs> smart. And so a lot of these swords and stuff made it through the mouse insurgency uh, process. But I mean, when I was really young, I had dreams about these swords and going up into the village as a ninja and having to like reclaim the sword and so yeah, I, I would say the, something about the village and the village life had a really profound um, uh, aspect on my upbringing, and uh, like you say, one of the weirdest experiences there that I've that I've experienced. I mean, uh, elsewhere, you know, stuff in Peru, stuff in Egypt, for sure. <laughs> but, yeah, your uh, nettle story reminds me of a story I heard uh, from a guy who was in uh, World War II in the Philippines, and what the Japanese would do is because they didn't have your toilet paper, they would go out and get the big ferns, right? <laughs> so he would go out and he was the guy that took the ferns for him, right? And so he would go and he would rub nettles all over the ferns, the oil of nettles, and bring it back to the Japanese. And um, uh, I think he eventually, uh, he had to escape into the jungle because they figured it out that he was... <laughs> but uh, yeah. Uh, uh, so anyway, um, so um, you... Um, you uh, uh, also have come across, I can see it's there next to you, uh, what's <laughs> called the Dropa Stones, right? Correct. Um, what are so, those? Sorry, what? What are those? That's a really intriguing and long question to answer. Um, it, it, it starts with multiple stories. My story in Nepal and Bhutan is part of the story. Um, coming back to the States, uh, going to a couple conventions and hearing the story of the Dropa and the Dropa stones and the Dropa people, and then refreshing my mind and going, wow, in 1998, when I was in Bhutan, I met the Dropa. And what's interesting about the, the P's and the K's in, in Tibetan and Bhutanese language is they often fall silent. So Dropa is also Dropa. And this is similar in the story uh, we'll get into with the Ham people of Eastern Tibet, uh, Central China now, and the Kam people, because Kam would also be Ham, right? They would have this, this, this silencing of the K. And so... Aren't the Han after, people the ruling dynasty of China? That's the Han, H-A-M. Oh, okay. Like Ham, H-A-M. So gotcha. Yeah. Thank you. Which is why I, I think that they're the Kam, and we'll get into that. Right. So I, I started doing some research into it back then, didn't really think of it. And then last year, there was a post that came up and it kind of triggered something in me. I'm like, God, you know, I've actually met the, the Dropa Dropa people in Bhutan and in Ladakh. And so I was incredibly fascinated with the post and I responded to it. And all of a sudden, I'm in this challenge of, God, I really need to find out more about this. And so I went back and I watched every single documentary scenario that is around it which there aren't many there's some ancient alien episodes there's some other people that have done individual research strangely enough there's also a nepali guy who's done research and it's all in nepalese and i was pretty shocked to find that and i, I just started noticing that the story was the same over and over and over but every time somebody would retell it it had a little bit more of an embellishment here or there 
Right. And so as I go into all of my studies, my BS meter is in the red. I had a couple of hundred questions and I dove in and I'm like, I'm going to find out where this story originated from, um, all the elements around it, why I have this connection to the, the Drukpa, Dropa people of, of Bhutan and, and what I can discover. And so there are two tales, actually there's a couple tales being told here. Um, the, the original tales come out of Germany, Russia um, in the early 60s mm -hmm. and have been translated into French, English and several other languages. And in these translations, a lot of the story has changed or bits and parts of it. And so what has changed is now what you find in Wikipedia and literally what everybody has been repeating and repeating and repeating over time. And so I, I looked at this story and went, okay, wow, there, there's an interesting source here. Um, and I, I found one of the original German articles on this story and it's translated and it reads a little bit differently than the one that's currently being portrayed. And then I found the Sputnik 1967 uh, article, same uh, similar translation, but it has other stories involved with it and it's in French. And so recently a good friend of mine, Mark and his family ended up translating it for me. And by translating it, they were incredibly fascinated with the story. They're like, wow, I've never heard anything of this. And so looking at yeah, these- Yeah, I usually found that the uh, closer that article or, uh, is to the time of the discovery, the more accurate it is. Right. And it's, it's, it's like anything, you know, especially with transliteration, you have this game of telephone. Yeah. You, you hear one thing and it all of a sudden becomes something else and it changes, you know, and, and, and in place the story. But the, the story that's out there is, you know, basically this, this cultural archeologist and his team were in this remote region of um, uh, Kayan Barshan or, or Kayan Ula mountain range in uh, so Bayan Kula, Bayan Harshan and Bayan Ula, mountain ranges in China, which is also in Eastern Tibet. Right. And up in this area, there are a lot of um, caves that have Tibetan burials in them or Buddhist, old Buddhist burials, similar to what they found in Dolpo and Mustang in Nepal. Um, these are high altitude caves. The walls are adorned with art. Um, there's a lot of records kept there and, and burials. Of it's those. very cold in these caves. Yes, correct. And so they stumbled into this cave and they realized, okay, we found a couple hundred people buried here, along with these dropa stones, which are described as about a foot wide with a, a central hole and two spirals that go around uh, to the outside, kind of similar to what a record would be with hieroglyphic or, or um, write, writing of, of a sort. Okay, now what year is this? So this is 1938. Okay. This is similar to when the Germans uh, went into yep. Yep. Tibet looking for esoteric knowledge as well. Yep. Yep. So you have two, two groups coming from two totally separate areas. Yep. Uh, the Germans didn't really leave much of Lhasa, so they never really got into any of the interior of, of Tibet, but this group with Chibute did. And so he takes the stones, they find 716 of these stones, uh, takes organic materials, you know, des describes the markings on the wall of a sun, a moon, familiar star patterns, a mountain range, and then like a dotted line basically going from the star systems to the mountain range. Um, he thinks strangely that the burials are of prehistoric apes, but what apes bury themselves and make aren't where. <laughs> So th this story kind of got, you know, it's it's in the original story and the story that's out there, but it kind of got shelved. Why did he think that? Um, just of because of, of how the bodies looked. They were very short in stature, you know, uh, frail bodies, larger heads, you know, so something of a dwarf type. Thinking of <clears throat> people that are, you know, a little over a meter tall to four foot tall at max. Oh, goodness, they are small. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so obviously an intrigue there coming out of this 1938 story published in the 1960s uh, German magazine. Um, as I said, the story that's out there then describes uh, that the stones are removed, <coughs> materials from the stones are tested upon, they discover that it's jadeite, which is a form of granite, 
that is infused with mercury and cobalt, which is fascinating because both mercury and cobalt will create a magnetic and piezoelectric effect, as will the granite. Um, and then one of the stones is sent to Russia for testing, and they do oscillation harmonic testing on it to discover if it's conductive or if it's pulsing or if it has you know, any, any sort of oscillation to it. And they discover a rhythm of pulsation as if it's been electrically charged. Um, Chipote basically posts his, his findings. It's squashed by the scientific community of China. Uh, 20 years later, somebody in, in a similar department in, in the Be Beijing Academy of Sciences uh, translates this alien disk or Hom Kam slash Dropa disk um, to basically state that about 12,000 years ago, this is also based on other testing, an aircraft or a spaceship comes out of the clouds, crash lands in the regions, the locals hide in the cave 10 times, and then they, they realize through sign language and through offering that the people that have crashed have peaceful intentions. Um, his work is also squashed. <laughs> And so wait, this was, uh, in, uh, what was this, hieroglyphs that said this, or what? These, these are the hieroglyphs that said this. And so, on the stones. On the stones. And so a lot of people discredit this primarily because they would think that uh, with ancient Egyptian hieroglyphs, we had the Rosetta Stone, and that was the only saving grace that, you know, translated it from Greek to heretic to, right. to hieroglyphic. And so we all of a sudden had a way of doing the translations. Right. Um, then this story, you know, gets blown up in, in the 19, uh, 1978, a uh, gentleman named David Agamon writes or republishes the notes of his, the man he worked for as a secretary, this guy named Carol Robin Evans. And looking back, this, there's some interesting things around Carol Robin Evans, and part of it is his name isn't Carol Robin Evans, it's Carl Evans. <laughs> But the name has been kind of altered for the book's purposes. And David Agamon throughout the book says he's kind of altered some of the information in the book um, to make it a little more exciting, entertaining, you know, bit fl fluffing it a bit. And that is this book here. It's called Sun Gods in Exile. And so Sun Gods in Exile, this is an incredibly hard book to find. Um, I hunted high and low to find this and found a, a, an early copy of it. And I've, I've read through it twice now and looking over the information that I'm finding online, I'm, I'm, in a, I'm, I'm starting to become convinced that no one has ever read this book. <laughs> there are details in this book that, I mean, if they had in the late 70s based, based on you know, when it was published or the information that's in it um, from the 1947 when, when um, Carl Evans, Carl, Robin Evan goes into northern India and then hires a guy that basically takes him through Nepal into Tibet. Uh, he goes into Lhasa during this time and then he travels into uh, the, the far east portion of Tibet to find the, the Dropa Zopa people. Um, at some point close to where they are his guides abandon him and he then finds his way into you know, their village group, uh, announces himself. He's checked out by the villagers. They're all short in stature. And then he's kind of invited in as a Westerner who's there to learn about who they are because that's, that's basically what he described. And so he spends a little over a year there. He's taught the language. He's taught a lot about their culture. He's taught very little about where they came from and then the, the final third of the book is is finally the the guy that's been teaching him which is a really upper caste character named Lorgan La describes to him okay I guess I'm going to tell you the story of where we come from and he describes this amazing story of their you know transverse through the galaxy from Sirius you know after having their own type one type two civilization advancement um, they decide, you know, let's 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 move outside of our star system and find others like us within the galaxy. 
because they also had a realization that there were genetic cousins. It's, it's fascinating. It's written in this book in 1978. <laughs> and uh, it's so, really fascinating. Yeah, uh, there, there's a lot of this that, that just blew my mind when I was reading it. And I'm like, okay, I could see why a lot of people discredited this. Um, so we'll they're saying that the, the, uh, the Dropa people are saying that they came from Sirius. Yes. Type, type one, two civilization or? So they, they conquered their galaxy in a sense. But and wait, then, Sirius is in our galaxy. No, sorry. They conquered their solar system. That's right. Okay. So sorry. Type two. For the type two. <laughs> yes, correct. And so from that point, they were like, okay, let's now that we know that we have interplanetary travel, let's figure out if we can leave our own star and go find other civilizations and places that we possibly could inhabit. Yeah, Robert so, Temple is a good friend of mine, and um, he actually thanks me in the uh the second edition of uh, the Sirius mystery for rekindling his interest in Sirius. And um, <clears throat> it's uh, that's really, really interesting. I got to tell you, because I have a lot of research <clears throat> that I've done that actually points to the same thing, the same story, in fact, that they were, they were living on a planet outside Sirius 2, which mm -hmm. is, and that they, and that they came on a, in a ship, and that ship is the moon, is the story I heard. They came on a ship, and that ship is the moon. They lived inside it, and they could get around in space, looking like a, a you know, a, a just a an independent moon. Uh, and so, no one, anyone could see them would not know what they were. And they parked here, and um, and began to conquer the Earth, and that. Uh, Osiris, which is Sirius, and his name yep. is yep. Osiris, and Isis and Set uh, uh, were the first people to land here, and they created Egypt, and uh, Thoth was their scientist, and, um, and they were from Sirius, and uh, there's uh, the dog star, and um, uh, Sodet also is one yeah. of the, the, the people. Fascinating. Yeah. That's um in my my quick all right now, i'll, I'll clear up oh, one okay. other thing and i want to talk your story so yeah, yeah, yeah. The, the, your the story that you they say is in the hieroglyphs um you know that could be actually interpreted in a different way mm. than than the way that i'm hearing it interpreted what i'm saying is that twelve thousand years ago is a crucial period in yes. history okay is when policy and comment yeah, the comet came, and then the dire, uh, younger Dryas came for 1,200 years and almost killed everybody on Earth, except for people like near the equator. And um, and then we kind of barely recovered until recently uh, from this disaster. And so I'm I'm wondering if if the interpretation might be that they weren't necessarily people but uh, it was something coming from space towards Earth, which caused them to have to go into the caves to get away from it. And, um, and um, <laughs> this whole thing with the stones, I mean, so <laughs> clearly like the, the Dropa stones are like the equator of a, a higher, you know, a Taurus, right? It's clearly the, a Taurus electromagnetic field around it right. with the center uh, being the center of the Taurus. So it looks to me like the they're sing singularity, for, right? Yeah. yeah. They're used for some kind of powering of something. That's, that's fascinating that you say that. And so I was, I was going to revert to actually the original story. So also in the 12,000 year ago timeline is when Plato places the fall of Atlantis. Exactly. So in the original story out of the German publication, um, I, let me pull it up here because I have it in my notes. <laughs> anyway, in the original, uh, there we go. No, uh, I'll find it in a minute. In, in the original publication, this, this German UFO uh, digest basically from the 1960, it's uh, July, 1964, it's episode, or, version 95 so it's their 95th publication and so this tells the story of of the drop it's one of the first publications 
Um, in my research, they say, oh, it showed up in Vegetarian Universe, this German vegetarian guide that started in the 50s, but that is a dead end story. It never showed up there. Uh, again, it showed up in Chariots of the God. Again, a dead end story. It was never in Chariots of the God. And so looking at this original source, the source that's out there now says that one craft crashed and people hid in the caves 10 times. But the original story says that they came down in their gliders from the clouds 10 times. And then the villagers hid in the caves until they realized that they had come with peaceful intentions. And so I'm looking at this through, you know, two sets of eyes. They could be of extraterrestrial origin, or this could be a remnant of the Atlantis group. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Atlantis being more of a time period than a place. Right. And there were Vimyanas. So, Correct. Right. Fleeing wherever they were coming from and trying to Going find to the high mountains to get away from <laughs> the tidal waves. Bingo. And yeah. so this is why I've looked at the two stories and gone, wow, there's, there's been these two stories that are out there. And what, what's fascinating to me about both stories, obviously the Dropa Stones and then in Sun Gods of Exile, the, what they're called the Lalladoff plates. And in the book, they're described as being 12. One of them was stolen. And they're they're part of their record keeping. They're not part of a craft. They're not part of any you know anything like this. But in the original stories, the thought of these discs are they could be part of the craft, um, kind of like what we use with solid state or or, or freelance hard drives today. Um, they could also be uh, instructional manuals of sorts uh, on how to guide or or drive the craft or recommunicate with home, um, aspects like this. Uh, I do Why find would they leave them? Why would they leave them? They would need those in their, for their ship, right? Well, they were all buried. And then the remainder of their, of, of their peoples interbred and intermixed with the calm Tibetans. And the, again, the storyline dovetails so many other storylines. So Carol Evans, again, is in this area of Tibet. Carl, Carol, anyway, I keep bringing, <laughs> Carl Evans is here, and this is, you know, 1947, 1948, 1949, which is interesting because Hare was also in yeah. Tibet and also at the same time, yeah. um, and then in the 50s, the, the invasion happened, and they would have wiped through this area of Tibet first, yeah. which would have forced any group of people living up in the higher, higher mountains to either be persecuted, executed, or flee. Yep. So this is why I think this group of Dropa, Dropa, right, left and became nomadic. And so they wandered out of Tibet through Bhutan into Nepal, into Upper India, into Ladakh, all the way through Kashmir, all the way into the Black Sea area and back. And so there, there's another fascinating timeline there. Are they still um, really short? Oh, yeah. They're like four foot one, if, if wow. that, that at best. Um, I have a photo of my mom sitting uh, in front of this this temple area, and this little Drokpa woman is laughing with her about who knows what. And the woman is shorter than my mom sitting. <laughs> and so it's like, oh my God. And they they wander through and they wear this inverted like leather apron where the, the fur is on the inside and the leathering is on the outside. That, that's uh, the these, only way to actually really wear leather. Right? <laughs> They have these spider caps that are made out of like felted wool that you know they can tie up or keep them warm and they can unfold them or fold them back up. Um, a lot of them are wearing rain boots because you know they're traveling long distances and they're walking through rivers and, and complexes. Um, they're known for upper pasture grazing and, and planting. And so they'll, they'll plant stuff, move on, move on, plant, move on, and then come back and, and retend their crops. Yep. Um, they speak not Tibetan or Bhutanese or Nepalese, which is spoken in Bhutan, where a lot of you know a lot of them are. But they speak this Brokskat, which is a Shanai uh, language, and Shanai is interesting because it predates Sanskrit by about twenty five hundred years. So we're looking at a language that's around five thousand BC. Um, wow, which is that's it's fascinating. Um, in the book. So getting back to the book, so um, part of me has an idea that 
some of the information in the book was fabricated based on what the author states. Okay, we'll, we'll, we'll go there. But there is so much information in this book that if you were not somebody that was living in this area, had been around Tibetan, Bhutanese, Nepalese culture, had studied you know, mysticism and, and cultural myths, the information relayed in this book, you would spend so much time creating this information to fake the book that it, you, why would you do it? There, there are things in this book, there are cultural aspects in this book that the author in 1978 and, and the author, the editor, David Agamon, and the original author, Carl Evans, in 1947 would not have had access to any of this information unless they had spent time in this region. It just was, I mean, we, we take the internet for granted. We can, you know, we can do research in a heartbeat at our fingertips where back in the day, you know, you had to hunt down library books or yeah, straight. go out into the field. I mean, the best thing from Indiana Jones is, you know, don't spend your time in the library, go out into the right. field. And That's what I did. Sorry, what? <laughs> That's what I did. Oh yeah, exactly. And so, <clears throat> I've been in the field and I, you know, I'm, I'm starting to look at this through different eyes and, and part of what I'm finding through, you know, what, what I've been researching is, is really fascinating. Uh, why would you record something on a disc that you would use for a future tense? Well, you'll, you'll enjoy this one, Jay. Um, I have a copy of <laughs> the Voyager disc. And so on the Voyager disc, we put all sorts of our own hieroglyphics. Uh, there's yeah. there's no language on it. It's all iconography. Yeah. It's super fascinating. Um, the secondary disc, this is a replication of course, is, is a record that has images, video and sounds. And so somewhere on the Voyager spacecraft is a projector and, and a record player in order for whoever finds us to find it. Uh, we triangulate our civilization or earth by placing a dot of uranium on the disc. And then we have these triangulations of 16 points of the different pulsars and their pulse rates. Believe it or not, I know the guy that designed that disc. Are you serious? Oh yeah. my goodness. <laughs> yeah. So yeah. If, if we're doing this with today's technology to preserve our own culture of sorts or, or send a message, uh, how different is it from an ancient culture to do the same? which gets back to the bi and dropa disc aspect because the bi discs, which a lot of the dropa discs are said to resemble, this is a bi disc, by the way, it has um, a whole bunch of magical spells and, and rituals on it. Uh, I have two of these. Which, and what's it made of? This is red jade. And so it's kind of a, it's a soapier granite than, than jadeite. Uh, jadeite has more, you know, granite-like material, metallics, um, as I said, in infused within it. And so, so we need to find the record player. Bingo. <laughs> well, and this is what the Russians were trying to do with, with uh, oscillation and, and harmonic resonance, is they were trying to figure out what the pulse was that was going through this. And so after the 1960s, a lot of this information disappeared through the Chinese Cultural Revolution. Um, only in the 80s and 90s of some of these Baidists started coming back out. Uh, the Shangzi um, uh, people as well are incredibly mysterious coming out of China. Uh, their masks look incredibly alien, but also have this Olmec character to them. So there's kind of a, a, a cross, you know, cross world situation going on with them. But this has only been in the last, you know, 10, 15 years that a lot of these artifacts have come out of museums. And where and are the, the where are these stones today? The, the, the Dropa stones? Yeah. As they're described, no idea. Um, really? As, as by discs, uh, like I said, these show up in, in burials. Hmm, funny. The original Dropa stone showed up in burials. Um, they're usually buried with people of, of royal class, but they've also found several burials of by discs where there are hundreds in, in, a, in a burial site, hundreds of by discs. And some of them are blank. They're just uh, jadeite granite. Some of them have spirals on them, but obviously no hier hieroglyphics in, engraved in them. Some of them have writing that you know could be cultural history, could also be, um, uh, how do you say it, uh, lores and legend. 
historical values. There's there's sorcery and magic added to these things for good luck or bad luck, depending. Um, the most famous being the the emperor's jade seal, which which lasted. You know, it was talked about quite a bit. The emperor would always have it with him, and it was his source of power and magic in a sense. And then it, around the you know the beginning of the Han Dynasty, a lot of this stuff disappeared again back you know. A couple, a thousand years or so. So what do some people like write them off as talismans or? I, I believe so. And so, because they really, they don't really know what they're used for. And right. so some of them, you know, like I said, some of them have writing, a lot of them don't. And it's interesting that a lot of the ones that they have found are this jadeite that is, you know, cobalt or, or mercury infused. And so there's this question of, okay, what, what actually are these discs? And so, like, like I said, I've, I've been in two categories, either, either this is an amazing story to be told, or there is something of, of, of fact there. These discs do exist, right? Yep. The, the, the Dropa, Drokpa people do exist. They are a nomadic tribe. They're incredibly short in stature. They speak a language that's older than Tibetan, older than Sanskrit um, amongst themselves. Uh, this is kind of where I think the, the translation of the disc came from. Because if this was the 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 Kam and the Dropa people, there would have been a similarity of Kam Tibetan and maybe even Shanai, which to Chinese would look completely alien. And so this this character Sung Ung Nui uh, in uh, not Sung Ung Nui, so yeah, Sung Ung Nui in the '60s translated the discs supposedly, and on the disc was this incredible story of them coming down from the sky in their in their gliders. <laughs> And hiding in the caves, and it's 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 a fascinating one. Yeah, that is. Um, yeah. So, <clears throat> hmm. I wonder why they why they bury them with them. There must be some reason for that. You know, that that is a really good question. I mean, in all cultures, we bury you know artifacts and, and gems hmm. and gold and all sorts of. I mean the what we think of it, you know, the King, the King Tut exhibit is just unbelievable how much stuff they found in his, in his parish. Have we found anything like these anywhere else in, on earth, or is this the only place that we found? This, this is kind of the only place for the Dropa stones. However, uh, in the collection of Klaus Donna is the fertility disc, which is also about a foot wide with a circular hole in the, in the center of it. Hey, well, hang on one second, I'm gonna show you something. Yeah, no worries. <laughs> So um, I got this from a Quechua shaman. Oh shoots! Wow. Yeah, this uh, this was a uh, he, this is a, he said this is the most precious object in our spiritual system, and I was it's like you got this in uh, Peru. Oh wow! Yeah, 1997. I got this, oh, and um, I knew what it was, of course, immediately. Well, what was going on here? Right. But, you know, and you know, some people have, have told me that these were just weights for their um, their nets and Lake Titicaca or something. And I was like, no, you wouldn't need a, a weight this this strong. I mean, this That's is heavy. heavy. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> but again, it's made out of granite, right? And um, it has a charge to it. I've tested it, and um, electromagnetic field, heavy electromagnetic field. And um, <clears throat> I will set this like if I get hurt or something, I'll put it right on the wound wherever it is. Instant. So it yeah, I, I, it heals really fast. Wow. And that's what he told me to do when I when he gave it to me. And um, uh, and when I went through the airport when I'm coming home from Peru, <laughs> this thing like lit the uh, <laughs> lit the thing off, and it, are there all these guys are running around trying to figure out what I, you know, what I was doing, and I was like, just just a rock, man. It's like, like really... <laughs> so yeah, so <laughs> there is that, and Peru also has the um, uh, uh, the legends of uh, of escape into caves. Yes, uh, twelve thousand years ago, Cusco and, is littered with caves. Yeah, I, I know you've been there. Caves. I've been there with Brian Forrester. Yeah tunnel systems oh, everywhere deep into the mountains and um this is the uh, same in Kathmandu Nepal there are tunnel yeah, systems all over there yeah that's right and um um uh uh, uh clearly uh Fulcanelli tells us that there's two places that you go 
at the uh, w when the world uh, is coming to an end. One is Tibet, Nepal area, and the other one is the Andes. And he said, those are the only two places you'll be safe. I live in Colorado, so I don't know if I'll be safe, but I hope I am. But um, you're I'm, in the Four Corners region, so there's it's supposed to be the uh, safest place in, the, safest in the United place. States. Yes, I know. I'm not that far from there, so that's good. Um, but there's also uh, 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 um, all through the Four Corners. People don't know this, but all through the Four Corners area, um, northern Arizona, southern Utah, are incredible labyrinths of tunnel systems that are both natural and carved. And um, there's a, um, a book. It was a book, and believe it or not, it was a book about Watergate back of uh, the Watergate scandal. And in the book, it was written by uh, the guy that uh, squealed on Nixon, James, John Dean. John you, Dean you wrote, wrote a book. <laughs> yeah, John Dean wrote a book. And the book is, you know, him just trying to exonerate himself from being a scumbag. But, um, you know, typical politician. But <laughs> near the end of the book, somebody pointed this out to you because I'm not going to read a 300 page book by some BS dude. But somebody said, go, go get the book. And I got it and go to, you know, page well, 220 or whatever and read it. And so I go to that page and in the book, he's uh, Dean is saying, one of my favorite things to do late night in the White House was to bring out the bottle of brandy and start talking to, and I can't remember the guy's name, <laughs> high-level CIA agent, right? And, and listening to him regale us with his stories of exploring the secret tunnel system under Arizona. And I was like, wow, there it is, you know? And um, so I'm going to say the same thing is going on in Tibet and Nepal, that there's these vast tunnel systems, and they don't want us to know about it. Nicholas Rorick uh, at Franklin yes. Delano Roosevelt's orders went to go try to find him and the the he was, he was there to find that and and the Sintamani stone which is that's right another that's amazing right. fascination that comes from Sirius in a box with four other items so. <laughs> yeah um, yeah and then there's you know I'll tell you another peculiar thing about Sirius um that um uh, I've kind of uh, been trying to bust my noodle on um so we know from the Egyptian hieroglyphs that they worshiped July 23rd as the helical rising of Sirius, right? So summer equinox, yeah. Okay. So this is 4,000 years ago or so. Give right? or take, yeah. Yeah. But you know when the helical rising of Sirius is right now? It's, it's August 6th. It's much later, yeah. It, it should be much further along than that. Yeah. I mean, it doesn't make any sense. And then when I asked astronomers about this, they they give me this weird thing about, well, we're in odd orbit with Sirius. And I'm like, in an odd orbit with Sirius? We don't orbit Sirius. And, 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 and that's where the trinary. <laughs> yeah. And I'm like, wait a minute, maybe we do orbit Sirius. And it's always kind of in that same spot, right? So the procession is going on around us, but Sirius is curiously remaining kind of stationary. In the same because, place. Yeah, it's, it can't be. It should be so, 4,000 years would be one sixth away around the great. So it should be way over here somewhere. Not <laughs> So Sirius yeah. is part of every past and present cultural and religious situation. I find this yep. incredibly fascinating. Um, if you look it up through NASA or through space observers or any of these uh, astro astronomy and astrological um companies and, and observatories uh, they looked at it once and they never looked at it again and th there's really no information about Sirius it's 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 kind of in a cloud of mystery in a weird way uh, that's for, right and we for, for the Masonics it's the star they worship you know right. uh, Sirius the XM Homer, it's the dog star it's like what Homer is described on? it as red um Oh, interesting. In the Odyssey, so Homer describes Sirius as being a reddish star. And now so it's a white now star. Now it's blue. So yeah. it, is, it has gone through some kind of transformation since Homer, and we really don't know what that is. And, of course, we know that the, uh, the people in Africa that, uh, that uh, Temple writes about, um, uh, they got all the their, yeah. Yeah, they got all their information from, from the beings from Sirius, 
who and also um hang on there's another great another part of this it's in manly hall's book secret teachings he has a uh a piece of jewelry <laughs> yeah <laughs> but not easy reading you know i have the book on my shelf <laughs> but he has the great secret of of alchemy or no the secret of egypt and it's a uh, uh like a piece of jewelry and then if you go and you look at the uh, uh you go to temple's book and you look at the orbits of, of sirius and, and a and b it looks just like this that thing from secret teachings that is the Egyptians greatest secret, right? Oh, wow. So, yeah. And uh, I mean, I've been into, at this dude for years. I've been after Sirius and trying to figure out what it's, Sirius It's is. a half circle with a, with a rod through the center. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, and two yeah. dots. And Hall, Manly Hall does not understand it. And we wouldn't understand it if it hadn't been for, you know, Temple and those French guys putting together all their work on, on Sirius. Oh, the Dogon mystery is incredibly fascinating because, I mean, as we know, their their dance rites and their ritual practices reenact the orbits of of the suns and and the planetary system. And NASA says, "Oh, there's no planets there," but we don't even study the star, so who who knows? I'm I'm curious to see what James Webb Telescope will come out with. I am too, actually. <laughs> I think it's going to actually show us some. Uh, things that are going to uh, spook us out. I really do. Yeah. Oh, for sure. Already. Yeah, I mean, yeah like, they're already wow. happening. Here, here we have galaxies beyond the barrier. It's like, this is this is interesting. <laughs> yeah, it really is interesting. The breath of Brahma, you know, this is this is the, the endlessness of the universe. Anyway. <laughs> yeah, so so my theory is, is that um, that the Syrians came here and they created like a secret country somewhere, right? Where they could live in peace. And, and, and then the, we would become their farmers and we would become their, uh, they would get all their <laughs> fresh water. And we would basically be, would be their slaves, which is exactly what it says in the Vedic texts, exactly what it says in the hieroglyphs, exactly what it says in the uh, Sumerian tablets, right? And, um, you know, the names have changed, but the story kind of remains the same. And that they are, my theory is that what they're doing right now is they are taking us from a, uh, uh, to a, uh, a, 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 a second, a planet, a, 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 a type, type two, two civilization. Type yeah. two civilization. That's what's going on and right in front of us right now. It's what the WEF is. It's what all of this is. It's them. And, and, and we have no say in it. We have no say. We're going this way, and you can you can drag your feet or whatever, like I do. But you know, you're going that way. There's nothing that yeah. they can do about it, and and uh, um, and that this has been a project for a long time, for maybe thousands of years. This project that's reaching ahead right now, and that's why I'm so interested in the Dropa Stones because I we have. I believe, if I'm not mistaken, I think there's some kind of memory device. Um, mm -hmm. We may have our entire history on those stones, uh, going back all the way to the beginning. I, I don't know. I mean, it, it, it seems like a lot of work to go to make these things. It can't be easy to do. And um, to make sense. You have to saw them. them on a lathe and you're sawing through, you know, as we know in Egypt, granite is a you know, explicit word, tough stone to, to cut, man. I mean, that's. Yeah, but they didn't have any trouble with it, apparently. They, they cut it like butter. And it's fascinating yeah. because there are so many different micron sizes that you're working with within the granite that would screw that up with, with a conventional blade. Unless Absolutely. You were something and, that was high, high revolution um, as, you know, as. Um, now, John Anthony West showed me a, a, Chris a, a <laughs> he showed me a, a stone in egypt i can't remember where it was at maybe Sayus. and he took a, a paper clip and unfolded it so it was this long right and he stuck it into these little tiny hieroglyphs about this big all across the stone and he stuck it and it was down two inches who in the world could drill a hieroglyph two inches into granite and have it have it keep its integrity that's yeah, the, you know, without it shattering and this yeah it's like wait this is this has been uh, i did a documentary 
I need to go back and actually change a lot of the information in it since I found out even more. But I, I think I sent you a link to it. I did a documentary on a lot of my findings around Dropa. And as they're talking about these microscopic hieroglyphs, I'm, I'm sitting here going, okay, granite, you, you can't, no. without shattering the matrix, you no. cannot do this without intense heat. Because they and they leave no trace of heat. Yeah, then this is the other mystery. Yeah, there's, there's no the trace mystery. of any heat. So, yeah, I mean, even a laser would leave some kind of fusion and, and burr the surface because Absolutely. of the different the different micron levels of of granite because yeah. it's got all sorts of crystals that are different sizes embedded within its matrix. That's right. That's right. So I think they're using they're using the actual piezoelectric qualities of the rock to somehow do this. And I can't. That's all I can just tell you. I can't go any further. I have well, no. I, idea. Having been in the Great Pyramid, I know exactly. You know what what you mean. It's yep. it's it's fascinating, and it's yeah. another it's another one of those hundred questions. It's like wow, going yeah, to we've Peru, lost I, more than we've gained for sure. That's for sure. I mean, we've just lost all, of, and we're losing our memories even now. Um, you know, I, I was, I've been in a mad rush for 20 years to try to um, recover uh, all of the uh, diaries and plans for how they built the cathedrals, right? Because we don't even know how to do that. I have anymore. no idea. No, have idea. no idea. We, that's why I know they're, they're never going to fix Notre Dame. Oh, they're just yeah. going to build a big glass yeah. metal facade and call yeah, it the gonna day. Be super oh, ugly. Right. And, and what's interesting about that is if Notre Dame and the cathedrals are actually um, like capacitors, which is what I believe they are, they're kind of a low density piezoelectric capacitor. Um, once you remove the wooden roof, You've destroyed it. Work. It's done. It's all over. Well, and it's it's the same with the stained glass. So you have yep. you have light frequency, and then yep. a lot of the old cathedrals would have the labyrinth. Yep. And so you have you have energy work, and if you yep. stand in the center, and you know the organs are being played, you're the Gregorian you're in, chants, and you're in this phonic, you know, Merkaba in a sense. You're you are you're in, exactly a, right. in a vortex. Yeah. Yeah, and we can't reproduce that. That's the thing, and not look, even look at the cathedral in Barcelona, right? I mean, yep. how many oh years my. they they're still not finished with it. They're still they doing it. Finish it. Yeah, you know, <laughs> in, in Salt Lake City, we can build a cathedral in ten years. In Europe, it takes one hundred and fifty. I mean, <laughs> huh, the damnedest enough. thing I've ever seen. <laughs> I guess we're just superior. Yeah. Well, yeah. <laughs> Hey, well, listen, uh, Hans, it's been great having you on, and uh, uh, I learned a lot. I, don't, I can't always say that with somebody when I'm interviewing them, but I learned a lot, and uh, the, um, the, uh, uh, my work involves the catastrophe from 12,000 years ago. It, it, it involves Sirius. It involves these stones that are all over the place, like this and like that. Have the same configuration <laughs> and uh, and um, and higher dimensional physics, which is what yeah. this also record, you know, is are all about. And uh, so that's why I found your uh, story fascinating. Besides, I find um, anything in Asia. I don't know why, but I'm just super fascinated by Asian occultism uh, and their uh, the the things that they believe are almost like science fiction stories uh, yes and there there i mean some of the other books i have here explain a lot of this but i mean a good a good read with you know extraterrestrial and and interdimensional lore and legend of china is this book oh my goodness uh, I, i'll definitely get it yeah unbelievable stories in this book I okay mean, last short, question short descriptions yeah but they're fascinating last question why do yeah, they keep uh why do they keep us from looking at the pyramids in China, do you think? Hmm. Uh, what's under them? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So uh, if you look at the ley lines of the world, where, where do a lot of them go through? Um, what's, what's around this area of Sichuan province? Uh, you have you know, the Yangtze and the Yellow River. Headwaters are up in the mountains near, near here. Um, a lot of the ancient sites, because of the dams on these rivers, have been flooded. Um, they, they turned a lot of these sites into hills during the Cultural Revolution and planted trees on them and terraced them, which is fascinating because in Washington State, just north of where I am, is a 
cinder cone, but it's also terraced and it, gosh darn it, it looks like a pyramid. <laughs> and, and, and I've been up it and it's, it's, it's a fascinating spot. And so it's like, okay, we're doing this in China as well. Why? Um, a lot of that area is also where they found um, the, the army of the dead, right? The mummies, uh, right. Not just the mummies. Oh yeah, the terracotta. The terracotta army, yeah. Yeah, right, yeah, that's so, fascinating. So this is all in that area as well and is related to the, the emperors that these, these pyramids are associated with. Um, why are they hiding them? Not sure. Has anybody done any archeo uh, astrology on them? No. No, nope, no. Nope, Maybe right. Graham Hancock, but I, I don't think so. And so I don't think he's been allowed to go go there. He's tried. Not not so much go there, but look at them from satellite, you know, and, and see what their arrangements are. And I mean it's it's fascinating because the what they call the Great White Pyramid of China is larger foot footprint than the Great Pyramid of Egypt. Yep. And that's a massive footprint. <laughs> yeah. So yeah. Um the I think, you know, like I said, um, it, it kind of comes back to what we did when we went into space and we approached some somebody like the Brookings Institute. And we said, hey, uh, we're going into space. What can you tell us, right. you know, about implications of how this would affect humanity if we find artifacts of our own or ancient artifacts? And so what did they say? They said, well, in order for the, the religions and the people of the world to not freak out, you've got to slowly drip this information and this technology out through media through news reports, through personal sightings, through contact e events, and through movies. And since you know that time period, it's been drip, 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 run, 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 faucet, you know. And I think other nations in the world have seen this this way of putting stuff out and are kind of mimicking it. Why? Well, China's now on the moon with their robots, right? And so yeah. they're starting to drip some of this information through their photos and now through stuff that's being released in their museums and you know even though they're having a you know an unfortunate match of cultural uh, impact right now on their own people i i do think that at some point there is a lot of this drip 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 turning into a faucet for them and same with other nations i mean it's everybody's starting to starting to see that oh wow the us is now you know releasing even more information <clears throat> True or bogus, we don't really know, but you know, all of a sudden, this is the hot topic since you know 2020. Well, my uh, I have a, a person that's in German intelligence, and he tells me they're going to introduce the alien to us very soon. Here, haven't so. they already? <laughs> Aren't we <Yeah>. them? <laughs> I see them all the time down the street from me. Yeah, right. <laughs> come, come to Portland. I've got four of them living at the end. Yeah, of my you got <laughs> lots. I've been to Portland. Uh, <laughs> all right man listen it's been Excellent. great uh talking to you and really interesting subject and uh uh just thanks a lot i appreciate your time jay and thank you for the interview this has been great i, I look yeah. forward to future ones yep okay everybody i'm uh, jay widener this has been reality checked another fascinating show got more for you coming uh thank you for getting me up to twenty five thousand. i'll sit 30 then 35 and let's keep it growing uh thank you very much and i will see you soon